Okay, let's get uh, started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this third panel of uh, this year's uh, Russia conference. Uh, my name is uh, Henry Kim. I'm a senior researcher uh, and the Asia coordinator here at uh, NUPI. And in this panel, we'll discuss the relatively new kid on the block in uh, uh, the Arctic, uh, namely China. Uh, China has traditionally not been an important player in the Arctic, but with China's growing power and influence, that is uh, changing. Uh, China recently launched an Arctic policy paper where it, uh, to the consternation of uh, some, labeled itself as a near Arctic state. Uh, China's interest in the Arctic is increasing, so there is also increasing debate about China's future role in the Arctic in, in policy circles. And uh, as with broader debates about China, uh, opinions are often divided. Uh, where some see China as an inevitable and even responsible uh, Arctic actor, other points to uh, China as a potential challenger of uh, Arctic governments uh, or even a long-term security uh, threat. There is also debate about how important Ar the Arctic actually is to China. Some ch see China as having important interests in the Arctic, for example, in terms of shipping and resources. Uh, others claim that this is somewhat overblown, that its presence is still quite limited and uh, perhaps likely to, to remain uh, so. Uh, and there is debate about whether China's policy, uh, whether its Arctic area policy is unique or a more general expression of its foreign policy preferences and practices. Um, to illuminate some of these debates, we are very fortunate to have two excellent uh, participants in this panel, uh, one who is a renowned expert on Chinese foreign policy and another one who is an expert on uh, ocean governance uh, in uh, the Arctic. Um, Yunsun uh, is the director of the China program at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, she has worked extensively on Chinese foreign policy, uh, including China's Arctic policies. And Alf Håkon Hul is a professor of ocean law and policy at the University of Tumsa, and he has worked extensively on ocean governments and, and Arctic governance more, more, more broadly. So uh, welcome to uh, both of you. Um, before we get started, I also want to welcome the, uh, the audience. Uh, it feels a little bit strange to be chairing a panel where I'm sitting in a room pretty much by myself, but I know you're out there and I hope we can make this session as interactive as possible. Uh, we really, very much welcome your participation. So throughout the panel, you are welcome to submit questions to the panelists. Feel free to send them in at any time. You don't have to wait for uh, Q&A to start. Um, we will have someone looking at and sorting questions throughout this session. And um, if you want, you're welcome to state your name and affiliations, but it, it's not necessary. Um, so, just to get the discussion started, I want to ask you a, a question first, Alf Håkon, about ocean governance in the Arctic. Um, I mean, China is a major fishing country and its fishing policies are sometimes seen as controversial. But at the same time, it's been a part of the negotiations which led to a uh, precautionary moratorium uh, on commercial fishing in the Arctic Ocean. So, what do you see uh, as the prospects for Arctic fishing uh, or fisheries governance and how can China play a constructive role uh, there and in global fisheries management sort of more broadly? Uh, well, that is uh, a very big uh, question or rather uh, quite a few questions, but uh, uh, for starters, uh, the Arctic Ocean is uh, a huge ocean. It's uh, something like 20 million square kilometers. Uh, which is about 10 times the size of the Mediterranean. So it's a huge area we are talking about. Uh, the central Arctic Ocean, uh, which is ice covered uh, most of the year, um, it uh, fits to the north of the continent, and uh, there is no commercial uh, fisheries in, uh, in that uh, area. Uh, this uh, the Arctic is, however, significant uh, when it comes to commercial fisheries in its uh, sub-Arctic uh, seas. The marginal seas, like the Bering Sea uh, between uh, Russia and America, 
the waters uh, between Greenland and Canada or, or the bottom sea situated to the north of, uh, of Norway and, uh, and Russia. So those areas are important in terms of, um, of uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, all fisheries in the Arctic are um, sustainably managed. Uh, they are, however, also fully utilized, so there, there are really no prospects for uh, newcomers to to uh, uh, gain uh, gain fishing quotas in that region. When it comes to the Central Arctic proper, where the um, newly negotiated agreement to prevent unregulated uh, fishing. Uh, this part of the Arctic Ocean has virtually no um, prospects of commercial fisheries in the newer or intermediate uh, future due to the fact that it is has uh, COVID. And um, the moratorium uh, is set to uh, enter into force as soon as all 10 participants in the agreements um, have ratified it, uh, and that is not the case yet. So there is at least 16 years until anyone will think about uh, uh, fishing there, and most likely a lot more. This is way beyond, uh, way ahead into, uh, into the future, and really very difficult to, uh, to give a, a, con a firm answer, uh, answer to. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the the problem of overfishing, there is uh, no reason, as, as I understand it, to expect that we would see it uh, at least in the in the short term and in the Arctic Oceans. No, uh, the expectations regarding uh, fishing in uh, the central Arctic Ocean, as we hear some people talking about, are totally overblown and uh, has really no basis in uh, in uh, in the facts on on uh, the ground. Um, if I can ask you another question, a bit uh, a broad one also perhaps. Um, I mean, how unique is the Arctic Ocean governance issues? Is it similar or different to uh, global o ocean governance um, and, and the challenges of it more broadly? And um, how could China best support sustainable ocean governance um, in, in the Arctic? So, um... I think uh, China, like any other country uh, operating in uh, the world ocean, uh, can be supportive of uh, uh, ocean governance in the Arctic and everywhere else by implementing the law of the sea convention in uh, way and by buying, subscribing to other important international agreements in ocean governance. And for China in particular, uh, it is not party to the 1995 UN Fish Stocks Agreement, which requires country to, countries to apply a precautionary approach and so on and so forth. And an important uh, step for China globally, uh, it's really a global fishing power would be to ratify the 1995 UN Fish Stocks Agreement. That's sort of uh, the num number one on the list. Thank you. Uh, this sort of brings us to a broader point, nam namely whether China's approach to, to global governance or even its foreign pol policy more broadly um, is, a, is a good guide to its uh, Arctic uh, policies. Um, I mean, Yunxin, you have studied uh, China's engagement in the Arctic quite extensively. Uh, do you think it's valid to sort of draw a connection between Chinese foreign policy and its behavior in other areas and its Arctic policies. I mean, some have even compared, like Mike Pompeo did, uh, the US uh, Secretary of State, um, Chinese policy in the South China Sea and its possible future policies uh, in the Arctic Oceans. Do you, do you think that's a valid comparison? 
Thank you, Henrik. That's a great question because we see many, uh, many officials and experts have drawn comparisons between China's actions in the South China Sea and its future potential behaviors in the in the Arctic. And the logic is that based on China's traveling behaviors in the South China Sea, the popular conclusion perception is that such behavior represents a Chinese pattern in all maritime domains, especially in a remote and faraway regions such, such as the Arctic, China will not be bound by the rules. So I think that view misses some important distinctions between South China Sea and the Arctic region, as well as China's distinct agenda in these two areas. So China's goal in the South China Sea is to keep it closed, especially keep it closed to foreign military and political power. But China's goal in the Arctic, in comparison, is to keep the region open so that China could demand as much as freedom and access as possible. So if any comparison can be made, I think the, the more proper comparison for China's goals in the Arctic is, um, is to its goals in the Indian Ocean, which is primarily focused on access for China's future potential blue water navy, and also for the exercise of China's future global presence. So I would say that the, the comparison is more appropriate between China's behavior in the Arctic and its behavior in the, in the Indian Ocean rather than South China Sea. Because uh, this is the other distinction that, um, that we need to make when we compare China's behaviors in different maritime domains. So we know that according to UNCLOS, one of the dominating principles is that uh, the land dominates the sea, which means that maritime rights are the derivatives were originates from land territory. And that is a principle followed pretty much everywhere in the world. But in but South China Sea in China's playbook is an exception because China's rights or China's perceived legitimacy in the South China Sea originates from the nine dashed line. Actually, it was originally the 11 dashed line that was drawn in 1947 by the KMT government at that time. So based on that nine dashed line, China's interpretation of the South China Sea has always been one based on historical waters or historical rights, which is not a well-defined or widely accepted legal argument. But based on that concept, China claims that the land features within the nine dash line in the South China Sea are, are within China's historical rights. But it views artificial islands with the understanding that those islands do not afford territorial waters or the EZs. So regardless of those claims and the artificial islands, they do not, um, and China does not have any similar grounds to any claims in the Arctic. So I would say those di distinctions are very important. Uh, yes, and this uh, goes perhaps to, to Al Falcon. Uh, the reason why some um, uh, draw comparisons between the two is that China, by many at least, is regarded as uh, potentially in breach of UNCLOS uh, in the South China Sea with the ruling uh, by, by the a tribunal on on its uh, on its claims. Um, so I guess that's why uh, some perceive you know the South China Sea as as a valid uh, comparison. But but if you compare it to the Arctic, I mean, is there any sort of signs that China is not you know uh, disregarding international law um, in in any in any sense? Well. Uh... I think it is difficult to compare uh, the situation in uh, the South China Sea with the one in the Arctic. Uh, the South China Sea is like uh, 3 million square kilometers. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is almost 10 times bigger. Uh, the South China Sea is surrounded by some of the most densely populated uh, areas on the planet. Uh, the Arctic is uh, in the other end of, uh, of uh, that scale. Uh, in terms of economic activity, it's extremely low in the Arctic. It's extremely high in the Central Arctic Ocean, in, in the South China Sea. So, so I think it's, uh, it's hard to make um, a, a comparison. And for uh, in, in legal terms, uh, 
the Arctic Ocean is more or less uh, settled legally. Uh, all major boundaries are agreed. Uh, uh, in the South uh, China Sea, there is no agreement at all uh, uh, when it comes to, to, to boundaries. So it's very hard to make that uh, comparison in a, in a meaningful uh, way, really. Okay, it seems uh, you both agree that it's uh, not a, that much of a, a fruitful uh, comparison uh, necessarily then. Um, I want to ask you another um, uh, question then, and since this sort of, I mean, this is an extension of the previous one in, in, in a sense. Um, one of the reasons why uh, many uh, are sort of nervous about the, uh, China and the Arctic in the long term is the prospect of, of military, uh, of a military presence uh, in the Arctic. That was something I think uh, was touched upon in one of the earlier panels today uh, too. But what do you think the prospects are? So far, um, as far as I know, uh, the PLA Navy has never crossed uh, the, uh, the, uh, the polar circle. Uh, so the, the presence has been I mean, not even limited, but 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 even non-existence up in, uh, up until uh, till this point. Thank you, Henrik. That's a great question. We hear about this China's potential military threat in the Arctic a lot, but most of the argument, if you ask, if you look at it very carefully, most of the arguments is based on speculation that China may, China might, China could without much of substantiation of the concrete evidence that's for what China is doing and also what kind of capacity that China has developed that will afford it the military power projection capability in the, in the Arctic. So I would say it's based on the potential, uh, speculations about the potential rather than concrete assessment of China's intention and its capability. So we, when we look at the China's strategic design about its approach to the Arctic as a non-Arctic country, which China understands very well, I would say that identity really forms the core of China's approach to the Arctic. Because China understands it's not an Arctic country, it's, it has refrained more or less from participating in the high politics issue because those are very contentious. And especially in the military and security aspects, if China tries to participate in those, in those field and appear to be competing in the Arctic, it's going to un, un, unavoidably set itself as a target. So if we look at China's record and the pattern of its behavior, China has focused mostly on what science diplomacy, science and research in the Arctic, maritime research focused on, for example, govern global governance issues such as environment, uh, uh, the climate change, uh, fishery issues, and also a lot of people have speculated about China's economic intention, uh, for example, China's investment in the infrastructure in the Arctic and whether those infrastructure could be turned into dual use for facilities. So I think all those speculations or questions are valid, but they do not afford a, a concrete conclusion that China has a major military strategy in the, in the Arctic. So instead of establishing China's potentials and speculating on the possibilities, I think the efforts should be focused on assessing probabilities and, and capabilities. So that probably requires net assessment of China's military capability, especially for its operation in a high altitude region like the, like the Arctic. So we need to be vigilant about China's intentions and activities, but also vigorous in gauging the nature and the depths of the threat it concretely poses. So, um, and another a shortcoming or another weakness for China's potential military uh, or security presence in the Arctic is that such a presence will have to be endorsed or at the minimum not objected by, uh, by Arctic states. And it's difficult to see that which Arctic state will be willing to extend that imitation letter, even including Russia. So without support from at least one Arctic state, the Chinese face significant technical constraints as well as difficulties. The fact that China, especially the Chinese Navy, when we talk about Chinese military in the Arctic, especially the Chinese Navy does not have a polar maritime environment to develop 
practice and exercise its operational capability in the high north is quite critical here. So without operational background and ability, the Chinese military, especially the PRA Navy, might be able to access the Arctic in the, in the, in the future, but to become a significant or dominant military power will require much more and is simply not in the, in the cards for China. Uh, just as a point for clarification for uh, of Focal also from from a legal point of view, there's no real, I mean, uh, sort of objections or 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 things that would prevent a, a Chinese military presence uh, in at least you know uh, high seas or even uh, exclusive economic zones uh, in in the Arctic, is there? No, nope, there's no such um, such legal constraint or legal require legal uh, constraint for Chinese Navy not to be in the in the Arctic, but we have to look at the capabilities. That do they have the operational background to to be in the high north? Because being in the high north, simply to make a statement by saying that while well, Chinese Navy deserves to be there, it is legal for it to be there, it will raise a lot of unnecessary suspicion without achieving any concrete operational goal. So I think for the Chinese military, even if they have the right to be there, they will have to complain. Uh, they will have to compare what are the costs and what are the benefits. Thank you. Um, actually, we, we sort of touched upon this, but I want to bring in some questions from the from the audience uh, as well here. Um, and uh, one question that perhaps goes to uh, both of you uh, is about, uh, I mean, the importance of the Arctic for for China and whether you know there is need for any sort of new legal uh, frameworks. Um, there are, I mean, uh, I think this is from um, Gunnel Yev. She's asking uh, or saying that China has periodically approached local Arctic communities regarding economic development opportunities, uh, including infrastructure. So what does the panel think of the potential of such initiatives and their potential impact on local and national security interest? And then, uh, there's another um, person in the audience asking if there is a need for new national le legislation uh, with the, regard to the way states uh, go, abo uh, go about when they when they see such um, activities. Um, so um, I don't know, Yun, do you want to address it first and then uh, I'll focus on? Sure, I will give it a try. Well, we do know that um, China's top two agendas in the Arctic, the first one is the uh, Northern Sea Route, is the Arctic as a shipping lane. And that is a potential down, down the road. It's not, um, it's not fully operational throughout the year. It's probably operational of three, three months for, for a year. So that's a potential down the road. And the other aspect of China's interest in the Arctic is, uh, is natural resources. And the, the Yamal project that China has cooperated on with, uh, with Russia on is uh, by, by today regarded as the single most successful, if not the only successful project, commercial project that China has in the, in the Arctic. So when we look at the China's exploration of economic opportunities with local communities in the Arctic state, we have seen that in Greenland, we've seen that in Iceland, we've seen that even in Alaska. And that has raised a lot of uh, questions as for well, whether the Chinese engagement with local communities is going to be compatible with, uh, with national agenda. And Canada recently also raised their concerns about whether Chinese investment in the in the Canadian Arctic region is going to be detrimental for Canada's national security. I think here is something that needs to be needs to be emphasized that Chinese investment or Chinese cooperation with any local community will have to be subject to the national legislation or the national laws of the Arctic states. So it's not like that China can drop the central government and go ahead to work with a local community in the uh, in the Arctic in the Arctic region. So I think the Chinese understand that issue quite well. Actually, a lot of Chinese companies feel quite frustrated that they have to work with two different layers of governments and two different layers of uh, of interest the central government's national interest and the local community's commercial interest. So I think to navigate those issues also pose a significant challenge for China's economic opportunities or exploration in the Arctic, which probably explains why there are many discussions about what China wants to engage in, in terms of economic operation in the Arctic, but the concrete projects that we are seeing 
or the concrete pro uh, projects that actually are signed and became operational is really minimal. It's, uh, it's a very small numbers of them. Thank you. Uh, Alfo, Kun, do you want to add uh, something on the um, on the need for legislation and if there is such a need? Yes. And uh, first of all, uh, legislation is evolving all the time. Uh, it's uh, not something that uh, happens uh, uh, really. It's, it's a continuous uh, process. And at the global level, uh, the most important development right now are the efforts to negotiate an implementation agreement under the Law of the Sea Convention regarding conservation of uh, marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So this has a potential application to the high seas areas in the, in the middle of the central Arctic Ocean. At uh, a more uh, regional uh, level, uh, I think uh, the Arctic is exceptional in uh, having seen uh, a number of uh, new legally binding agreements having been negotiated over the last uh, decade or so on uh, search and rescue, on international scientific cooperation, on oil spill prevention, uh, on, uh, on fisheries. We are continuously uh, developing their domestic legal systems uh, to the evolving uh, different uh, uh, challenges they are facing in the Arctic region. To provide one concrete example, uh, with the increasing emphasis on uh, threats to biodiversity in, in Arctic waters, Norway. Uh, regulation uh, one year hundred thousand square kilometers of seabed areas in the Arctic. That's a concrete example of, of how legislation is evolving at global, regional and domestic levels of uh, governance. I want to bring in some further questions from the audience. Um, one question is uh, about China and, and Russia. Uh, I mean, um, many uh, argue that the, the future uh, sort of direction of the China-Russia relationship is uh, going to influence potentially China's Arctic uh, policies. Um, I mean, the China-Russia relationship at a sort of broad level has been growing closer uh, in, in last years, particularly since uh, after 2014. Um, so I guess this one goes to you. And what do you see as the main areas of competition between China and Russia in the Arctic and the main areas of, of potential cooperation, uh, whether it's in terms of energy, uh, communication, um, military interests um, or other areas? Mm. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thanks to the audience. That's a great question. Um, so we know that Russia is an indispensable partner for Chinese ambitions to become a near Arctic stakeholder. As a non-Arctic state, China needs a strong advocate from an Arctic state for its activities in the, in the region. So against the backdrop of the US-China intensifying great power competition, and consequently the growing strategic cooperation between Beijing and Moscow, Russia is regarded by China as an irre irreplaceable partner for its Arctic exploration. Given Russia's location, its capability, its presence, its influence, and its status as a so-called Arctic superpower. But we have to understand that Russian and Chinese demands for each other in the Arctic are asymmetrical. In the Arctic region, Russia primarily has its eyes on Chinese financing in order to commercialize its underdeveloped planners, especially along the Northern Sea Route. But for Beijing, commercial considerations are secondary to the top priority of opening the access to and creating a presence for China as an Antarctic state. So these two goals could be mutually complementary in building and strengthening the Chinese presence and influence while serving Russian demand for financial and investment. And that's, wh that's why we saw the Yamal ILNG project remain China's most successful commercial project in the whole Arctic region. But so far, their cooperation in the Arctic has existed in the economic, research, governance, and navigation arenas. 
with the military domain as a more remote possibility. While Russia continues to enhance its military presence in the Arctic with multiple dual uh, civilian military use capabilities, from ports to airfields, China has pursued a lower profile in its Arctic activities, prioritizing scientific research, governance, energy, and shipping over hard security issues. This is not only because China doesn't wish to pose itself as a challenge to Russia's traditional military dominance, but also because Beijing does not yet have a functional military force that can operate in the in the Arctic today. So I think those are the areas that we see cooperation out of China and Russia in the Arctic, but their interests do not always align in the Arctic either. The most significant divergence is on the Russian definition and the administration of the Northern Sea Route at its territorial waters. China has kept silent on Russia's expensive interpretation of its rights and authorities, as well as uh, over the Russian so-called infringement on China's right to passage in the NSR. Chinese experts have argued that the stringent restrictions by Russia on foreign vessels, especially foreign warships in the NSRs, is direct violation of UNCLOS. However, considering the natural advantage Russia enjoys in the rules of navigation in the Arctic, non-Arctic states such as China still have to resort to consultation to protect their rights. So, of course, China cannot price Russia too hard, as uh, China also is using similar argument about internal waters in the South China Sea, and that's a, I call it a hypocrisy in Chinese position. And economically, Chinese interests and Russian interests also do not always align. They face constant struggles as the investor and also the investee, which I believe this conflict makes the polar soup road more a future blueprint rather than a near-term possibility. So despite the view that the Northern Sea Route is a more efficient shipping route, its commercial potential is constrained by the lack of viable infrastructure. While the Russian desire is for China to make such investment, the lack of commercial profitability of those projects and the Russian reluctance to concede ownership continue to stall real progress on the ground. Given that regular voyage on the NSR remains a future possibility, the Chinese are, in, are not in a hurry to invest in the infrastructures along the NSR, especially when the Russian terms are less than optimal. So I think those are the two areas where the Chinese interest and the Russian interest do not align and they oftentimes collide with each other. Um, but that does not negate the fact that Russia is still regarded as China's indispensable and irreplaceable partner in the uh, in the Arctic region. Thanks. That actually covers one other question that we uh, received here where that, um, I mean, by, by a person from the audience who asked whether um, China is seeking to assist Russia in developing its Arctic uh, infrastructure. Um, I want to um, ask a little bit about another player which was mentioned earlier today um, during the uh, foreign minister's um, talk with uh, with our director, um, which which we haven't touched upon today, namely namely the U.S. Um, and the prospects of um, rivalry between China and and the U.S. sort of influencing uh, the Arctic. Um, I mean. As, uh, as we've all seen, the rivalry between uh, the, uh, China and the US is, is really intensifying and, and the relationship between them is, is uh, almost plummeting by the day. Uh, so I want to ask you, Eunsun, um, how you um, see that uh, as potentially influencing the Arctic and, and perhaps I'll focus on also uh, whether that has the potential to sort of have an influence on, uh, you know, um, legal governance of, of, of the Arctic in the in the long run? Thank you, Henrik. I think that's a great question. It's, uh, it requires us to really piece out the cause and the effect here. So it's the competing, uh, the rising competition between US and China in the Arctic, the reason that there's a great power competition or because there is a great power competition, we're seeing we're seeing competition almost in all domains, in Africa, in Asia, and now in uh, starting in 2019 in, in the Arctic. So both uh, US DOD and the Secretary of State have publicly cast out on China's self-claimed status as a near Arctic state. 
and the China's economic engagement is regarded as precursors to much more invasive political and strategic ambition. And China's infrastructure development has the potential for dual use facilities, paving the ground to Beijing's permanent security presence in the in the region. But I see these speculations or these doubts or these uh, these narratives more as a result of the great power competition between US and China rather than the cause of the problem here. So there's the saying that if you are a hammer, everything you see looks like a nail. So when you see China as a competitor, China's action in all fields looks like competition. So I think that's a very important distinction to, to make here. But also to be fair, I think China certainly has not helped its own case in the, in the Arctic. The Arctic policy making in China is at best opaque, creating ambiguities in its priorities and ambitions. While China publicly claims its goal in the Arctic are about quote, quote, knowledge, protection, development, and governance of the region, the Chinese legislation also declares Chinese, China's activities, assets, and other interests in the polar regions as intrinsic to China's national security. So China's record of incremental development of overseas power projection capability in the name of asset protection, and we're talking about the naval base in, in Djibouti, a test um, offers and um, the dual use facilities in the uh, Indian Ocean, like the Guadar port and the Hambantota port, I'll suggest a pattern that could be repeatable in the Arctic. And observers only get a glimpse of China's capability when Beijing chooses to, public, to publicize its information, such, such as on its nuclear powered icebreakers. And these type of uh, lack of transparency exacerbates the anxieties about what other capabilities that China already have and their sleeps. So I would say that yes, great power competition is probably the origin of all this narrative that we see about China being a threat in the Arctic. But on the other hand, the ambiguities and the, the um, the opaque nature of China's Arctic policy making also offer us plenty of ground to be uh, to be suspicious. Thank you. Uh, you even have covered a lot of ground here, so I'll be brief on uh, on that one. Uh, of course, there's always uh, important uh, when you have great power rivalries. Uh, it's uh, most uh, that applies uh, throughout uh, history and uh, including now also in the Arctic Ocean. But uh, uh, the real manifest comes to the oceans and uh, oceans going on. It's uh, not that easy to see yet. Uh, and it's important to remember that uh, when we talk about Arctic governance, most of the governance in the Arctic uh, domestic governance in in the Arctic countries, and uh, and um, and uh, the international framework within which that domestic governance take place is uh, an agreed uh, global framework that also China and uh, the U.S. Uh, subscribes to. So, so that's uh, that's an important point. Uh, there is a question uh, for clarification here from Christian Oplam. Um, uh, the uh, all four can just say that the article is more than ten times the size of the South China Sea. I hope I did not. Uh, I, I think I said almost ten times. And uh, as you point out, um, the the South China Sea is about uh, three point five million square kilometers, and. Uh, the Arctic Ocean, it's a question of definition, but the way I've been talking about it, uh, as I said at the outset, it's the Arctic Ocean proper as well as the sub-Arctic seas, uh, including the Bering Sea, uh, the ocean between um, Greenland and Canada, uh, the water Sea, uh, let's say eight times the size of, uh, of, um, of uh, the South China Sea. But I really think uh, there are an, a number of other significant issues here, like uh, uh, law of the sea questions being more or less settled in the Arctic Ocean. They are unsettled 
in, in the South China Sea. Uh, there is a lot of economic activity in the one area. There is almost nothing in the other and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is another question here from the audience, which touches on the security uh, issues we, we have already dealt with, but but from a bit of a different angle. Uh, this is from Per Høyland. He's uh, saying that, I mean, Norway and Europe are investing a lot in space capabilities relevant for uh, Arctic and ocean governance, um, including navigation, communications, reconnaissance uh, capabilities. Um, He's adding that these may also allow for more extensive military and security presence uh, in the region. So I guess this goes to you, perhaps, uh, in the, uh, the such dual use initiatives and or, or capabilities drive competition or cooperation vis-a-vis uh, -vis China uh, in the Arctic? Well, that is a great question because that is an area that I think has mostly been uh, being being neglected, or in the in the Chinese uh, policy community, those issues are be being discussed more among the security folks rather than the uh, Arctic specialist. So I think there is a, there is a very large black hole there. So the Chinese do recognize that Arctic have significant security implications for China. So those security impacts are reflected through missile develop, uh, missile deployment and the missile defense system in the Chinese perception as the Arctic represents a shorter attack distance between North America and Asia. And there's also the potential of naval blockade uh, in, the, in the Arctic, which could affect the China's LNG uh, shipment from the Yamal Peninsula. And there's also the safety and security of China's LNG tankers and other commercial shipping in the, in the region. However, in the Chinese playbook, the Arctic was not a primary theater of uh, any potential conflict that involved China and the United States and Russia. Um, and the um, US and Russia are the most important competitors in the, in the region's security realm. It doesn't mean that China doesn't have ambition. It just means that such ambition are less likely to be vital or dominant in China's in China's playbook. Then, in terms of the development of the, uh, for example, in the space technologies, the navigation technology, I think China is also catching up quite quickly in those uh, in those areas. The deployment of China's Beidou GPS system and is uh, it now has become operational for a couple of years. And the Beidou system in the Chinese playbook, I have I have seen the discussion about the Beidou GPS providing better navigation technology to Chinese potential shipping uh, through the Arctic through the Arctic as well. So I think that definitely suggests a, a future area that could be very contentious for the competition of, uh, of technological advancement in the in the Arctic region. But so far, I think it's still uh, rather under the surface rather than being a, a open issue on the table. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one last question, which um, I think um, could go to uh, to both of you uh, from the audience. This is from Björn uh, Pedersen. Uh, he's highlighting that uh, Foreign Minister Suhai just said that China sought to influence international governance uh, amid its rise as a global great power. And he's asking, uh, where do you, uh, as in the two of you, I, I suppose, uh, see China, China trying to rewrite or influence uh, ocean and or Arctic uh, governance? Perhaps you can uh, you can start uh, to burn, but um, please keep it short. We only have a, a few minutes, a uh, few minutes left here. Well, um, I think uh, globally speaking, uh, uh, it, uh, what is happening in the, the South uh, China Sea and uh, China behavior there is uh, certainly not contributing to proper implementation of the law of the sea. Uh, whether that amounts to a rewriting, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly not. Uh, properly implementing uh, the law of the sea. Another example is uh, the global effort to rein in the growth in person capacity globally uh, with China is uh, expanding capacity and, and not really uh, trying to develop uh, the global guidelines in, uh, in that respect. In uh, 30 seconds, please. <laughs> Yes, I think it, it relates to whether we define China as the passive player in the international system that 
that should be following all these rules or China is as an active player should participate in the rule making. I think a lot of this clash that we are seeing between China and the international rules and norms comes from the Chinese anxiety that well a lot of the rules and norms were made without China's participation because China only became a global power or a meaningful uh, power in the in the most recent two decades. So I think that's a, that's an interesting question as for what approach we want to take to whether we, we want to absorb and welcome China into the international rules and norms, or we see China as a target, that these are the rules and norms and China as a, as a, as a member must obey them. I think if the if the belief or the, if the conviction is uh, is a ladder, then we're going to see more and more conflicts between China and the current international rules and norms. And China will use this bilateral diplomacy and try to buy its way to shape the narrative, to buy the opinions from other countries, and to change the international norms and the rules to its own to its own benefit. So I think whether that's going to be an interactive process or unilateral process is um, is going to determine the result significantly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's uh, everything we had uh, time for. Um, I want to thank the panelists for their excellent contributions uh, to, to this panel. I'm sure these are uh, debates that will um, continue for uh, for many years. Um, I also want to thank the audience for uh, listening and for providing excellent uh, questions. And uh, finally, I want to remind everyone that we have a great panel uh, coming up about US perspectives uh, on the Arctic, moving on to the to the next uh, uh, great power. Uh, that panel will be a conversation between the new US envoy for the Arctic, uh, Jim DeHart, and uh, NUPI research professor Elana Wilson uh, Rowe. So uh, with that, uh, thanks you once again for uh, joining us. Thank you.